All right, this is, this is my Tama Monarch Signature Series drum kit. Um, they, these shells are constructed out of maple and bubinga. It's a one ply of maple, well, not one ply, it's one layer of maple, which I think is three plies, then a layer of bubinga, then a layer of maple. Um, and they have reinforcing rings, which is exactly the same. Um, the sizes of these toms are 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, an 18 inch floor tom. The gong drum is a 20 inch shell. The bass drums are 24 inch by 15 inch deep. The snare drum is 14 by six and a half. The piccolo is 12 by five, I think. Five, five and a half, I'm not sure actually. <laughs> and the uh, popcorn is a metal shell that's 10 by five and a half. And four octobarns, uh, which are the low uh, set. Um, these drums record beautifully and they work very well live. Um, I don't actually change the sound of my drums from recording to live, it's exactly the same. Um, the only really two parts of the drum kit that would probably change, the snare drum. That's gonna change the most when recording uh, um, music because depending on the style of music, really depends on the style and the sound of the snare drum. So um, I might take this one snare drum and tune it differently, maybe put a little bit of dampening on it, um, or I might even choose another snare drum. It just depends. The other instrument that might change is the kick drum uh, in terms of the way, not so much it's tuned, the tuning will probably stay the same, but it's more the treatment, the dampening of it. Uh, whether the front head is live, whether it is, is fairly dead, whether there's more damping inside the drum. Um, those are the two basic elements that if you change the character of the snare and the kick, the whole drum kit is going to appear to change especially when I play differently. I would say 90% of the sound of the drum kit is gonna change by the way I'm playing it. So that's something, you know, you, you learn with experience um, and find out. You just find out different ways of uh, approaching the kit, the way of playing it um, will really change. Of course, the other thing, which I haven't mentioned, is all the microphones the balance of these microphones when you mix the drum kit will make it sound very different too. So it all goes hand in hand and uh, it just needs uh, a lot of experimentation and a lot of experience to know where to go with that. So let's get into uh, the miking of this drum kit. Um, there are, as far as I know, three types of microphones. Um, there's what we call a dynamic microphone, which is purely passive. It's just a moving coil and a magnet, just like a speaker. There's a condenser mic, which has a capacitor and it needs power. It has some electronics in it. So that's what we call phantom power, typically 48 volts. Although it'll probably work on 31 volts too. Um, and there's a ribbon mic which works in a slightly different way. Uh, typically is usually a figure of eight, which is its pickup pattern. Um, it has its own characteristics. Um, on the right instrument, in the right place, it can be beautiful. Um, and as far as I know, I don't know of any other microphone. So there's an electret, which is basically a cheaper version of a condenser. So all these microphones play different parts. And um, I tend to end up with a, um, a balance between using dynamic and condenser mics. You can use all dynamic, you can use all condenser. It just depends what kind of sound you're going for. Um, but typically, for me, what works, certainly as a starting point, the bass drums, I always use a, a dynamic microphone on the bass drum. In this case, uh, these days I'm using a Shure Beta 52 
uh, I used to use an AKG D12, and very occasionally I've tried a, a Sennheiser 421, sometimes an SM7 even. Uh, just depends what kind of sound you're going for. I've even had Shaw 57s in there, believe it or not. Um, it, again, it depends. If I'm using a front microphone, I don't always use it, but sometimes I do. Typically, I would probably use a condenser mic. Um, and that could be anything from a, a Neumann U87 uh, to a KSM44 uh, or a KSM27. Um, really depends. Or you could even put another Beta 52 on the front. You could even put a 57 on the front. It, again, really depends what you're after. Um, the snare drums, all dynamic mics. I'm using an SM57. I would say 99% of the time I use a 57 on a snare drum. I can get everything I want from it. I do not like the Beta 57. There's two inherent problems with it uh, for me is it already has been artificially EQ'd, which is a different sound to when you have a microphone that you add EQ to. It's a totally different animal. Uh, the other thing is the level is very hot. And if you're using older equipment, it can tend to uh, max out the, the, the mic pre. Um, so for me, an SM57 is, a, is the best starting point. However, occasionally I'll put a condenser mic. And that is usually if I want to have a drum, a snare drum sound that is less transient, less punchy, has more spread. A condenser with a lot of level tends to compress a little bit. Uh, just the nature, maybe the electronics, I'm not really sure quite why, but that's what happens sonically. Um, which can be very great if you want to do, if you're doing a ballad, a rock ballad, and you want a deep tuned snare drum, and you're not quite getting it with a 57, put a condenser mic on, anything. Uh, a KM84, a KM86 is gorgeous. Uh, you could even try an SM81, sure. Um, really doesn't matter. Um, Sony used to make a beautiful microphone. Uh, I don't remember the model number. Trident, again, used to use that on all their snare drums. But for me, it only works with that kind of tuning. It needs to be a quieter sound, which by tuning down you will get. And when you tune down, you usually have to dampen the drum because it has a very nasty low ring. That will also bring the volume down. And that's why a condenser mic will work. And it gets this beautiful big spread. And if you play the drum quietly and you use just the tip of the stick in the center of the snare drum and don't hit the rim, you will actually get a huge sound. It's a soft sound, but it's a very cool sound. So there's all these, these little tricks. On the tom-toms, this is a very dangerous thing to do. There are a lot of microphones, there's seven tom-toms here, and I'm using condenser mics. Um, one of the big issues that we have with all these microphones is spill and phase. Spill being that that microphone is probably going to pick up this and is probably going to pick up that and a little bit of that and definitely a bit of snare drum. Well, what are you going to do? Put foam pads in between each drum? No, the drummer will kill you. Um, so you have to use it to your advantage. I feel that a lot of uh, younger engineers these days are too concerned with this thing called spill. But if you know how to mic a drum kit and you know how to set your mic input levels, you won't have any problem with it at all. Phase, phase correlation. Well, phase, really all it is, is just signal arriving at two points at different times. That's really all it is. Well, in a drum kit like this, you've got an overhead which is four feet away from the snare drum. You've got a tom-tom mic that's two feet away from the snare drum. You've got a snare drum mic that's only just a few inches away. You've potentially got a big problem. 
Again, you have to use your experience and use your ears to, to get over the problem of phase correlation. You can do this by flipping the phase. Uh, typically, I'll always flip the snare drum. Um, it's tricky. It, it can be tricky because then you flip the snare drum uh, uh, signal 180 degrees, then you may have problems with the tom-toms. But this only really comes into play depending on the balance of everything. So again, if you achieve a really nice balance where you don't really have such a phase problem, you can make it work. But as soon as you start more using more than one microphone, you have a phase problem. You just have to learn how to use it. Um, another uh, little thing about overheads. If your left and right microphone are close together like this, there's less of a phase problem between left and right. If you put them far out, one over here and one over here, you have more problems with the phase between the left and the right. However, your stereo picture of two microphones that are further apart is much more pronounced and much greater and sometimes much more desirable. So again, you just have to weigh up what kind of sound you're going for and what you want as the end result. Um, all I can say is I try to position my overheads equidistant from the snare drum. So if I've got one over here, I want the same distance between this one. Uh, when the drummer hits the snare drum, I want to have the same signal coming into both overheads. That to me is a very good way to start. Um, but again, you know, there's, there's many ways of doing this. Back to the Tom Tom mics. Right, as you can see, these are uh, Shaw KSM 27s, they're condenser mics, and you might notice that the, the height of them from the drums is, is quite substantial. Uh, I've learned from working with a lot of engineers that it's best not to put your microphones too close. If the instrument works well and it's giving plenty of signal, then it doesn't matter. You can pull your mic away, it's going to sound more natural, and there's no problem with spill, leakage, or phase. It's absolutely fine. Um, so that's I, I prefer to use a side address condenser microphone. I think it's the most natural and it gives you a very good starting place. But that doesn't mean to say one day you might see me with a whole bunch of Sennheiser 4, M421s, a different sound. You could even put SM57s on the toms, they actually sound very good. Um, you could even put a smaller uh, size condenser mic. Uh, I've had KM84s on the drums, beautiful. I remember Dennis Mackay used to do that. Uh, he was one of the Trident engineers. Uh, at Trident in the early 70s, they used U67s, and they used to put keypexes on each channel. Um, you know, the is a noise gate, one of the early noise gates. So uh, again, all sorts of things. Everybody has their own uh, um, version of doing it. Uh, there's also, you don't have to multi-mic. You can mic this whole kit with three mics if you want, or well, two bass drums, four mics. It just depends what kind of sound you want. Um, a lot of the time in the 70s, we would have, uh, with a large kit, it would be one microphone between two drums. That happened a lot because we didn't have the channels. But generally, it's a thinner sound. It's a very organic sound, but um, I prefer to have each individual drum um, to, to be able to EQ and, and uh, process. Okay, uh, let's move on to the bass drums. Okay, here we are at the bass drum. <laughs> you can see I have a microphone here, Shaw Beta 52. Um, I also have a speaker, a woofer here. This is actually from uh, an NS10, Yamaha NS10 uh, uh, speaker cabinet. Um, and essentially, as uh, I said before, a speaker and a microphone are basically the same thing in reverse. Uh, I'm using this speaker as a microphone. So uh, this picks up the sound of this front head. Uh, it's obviously very limited in frequency response. 
So it gives what I call, I'm calling it a sub, uh, uh, for want of a better word. But I wouldn't say it was really sub, it's just a low end thump. That's what it is. And mixing in this signal with this microphone can give your bass drum some really nice weight. So that's an, it's an old trick. Uh, it's been around for years. Um, and I tend to record it. I don't always use it when I mix, but I always record it. It's good to have. Um, the output of this is actually very high. So I do use an inline pad to pad it down, pad down the level. And um, inside the bass drum, I don't know if you can see this, there is a paint can. And inside that paint can is, it's full of sand. Now, originally it had paint in, but paint is a little dangerous because I'd hate to see what happened if it were to split open. So I actually went to the trouble of weighing a gallon of paint and a gallon of sand. Amazingly enough, they were exactly the same. They, were, they both weighed 13 pounds. So I thought sand's a much better way to go. What this does is the bass drum, it's a big drum. And when you put the front head on, it makes the sound much more complex. It's much more dynamic, has much more low end, has much more high end. And it has a much wider range of, of uh, volume from very quiet to very loud. When you take the front head off, you lose bottom end, you lose top end, you lose dynamic range, which means it's much easier to record. And frankly, it's a much easier way to get a bass drum sound. But the problem with it is it's a little undynamic and it's a bit unmusical. And that's the problem I have with a single headed bass drum. Sometimes for certain types of music, I will. I'll pull the front head off and I'll just mic the bass drum as it is. And it sounds great, uh, very controlled. But like I say, a little flat sounding, dynamically, you've really got to hit it at the same level. Um, and um, maybe a little unexciting, a little unmusical. However, with the front head, you get all this back, but it's much more difficult to record. So by putting some mass inside the bass drum, like this, which is, I learned from Eddie Kramer, he taught me this trick. Um, it helps soak up that loose bottom end it helps soak up that ping, that top end, and it makes the drum more controlled and therefore easier to record. Uh, I tend to place my microphone halfway right in the hole here, just inside the hole. To me, that gets the, the sweetest tone from the bass drum. But of course, again, this can vary. You can try all sorts of different ideas. Um, also the type of mic, if you change the mic, probably gonna have to use a different position. Every mic seems to work best. My, my D12s, I used to put very close to the batter head. They work great there. Uh, just the design of the mic just seemed to work better, that's all. Um, if I were to use a condenser mic on this, like a, uh, like a KSM 27, and then I might wanna put it further away. It just depends, it's, it's all, all you know differences. Um, and then the only other thing is ambience mics. We can put those ambience mics anywhere you want. Um, we'll take a look at what these ambience mics look like in this room. Um, and there you have it. So, the signal path. Um, this is what I've chosen. For the kick drum, we're going insert, into the Impressor, out of the Impressor, into the Muse EQ, and then back into Pro Tools. For the snare drum, same thing, out of Pro Tools, on an insert, into the Impressor, out of the Impressor, into the Muse EQ. For the overheads, again, coming out of the insert in Pro Tools, I've got it coming in to the expressor, then out of the expressor into the X filter. These are stereo units. 
the uh, popcorn and the piccolo. Um, in fact, all I've done with that is uh, with those two is I've got a stereo envelope here. Um, the left hand side I'm using for the popcorn, the right hand side I'm using for the piccolo. Then we have the tom toms. The toms are essentially, I've got them bust in Pro Tools. Uh, they're going out through master fader and on that master fader I can then put an insert which is uh, coming to the expressor, it's a stereo compressor and then out of that into the X filter and then back into Pro Tools. Um, the Octobans I just have uh, same thing, uh, an insert and that's coming into the envelope this is a 500 series versions of these actually. Um, and then the ambience. The ambience I have coming into a stereo compressor and then out of that into the envelope and then back into Pro Tools and then of course out of Pro Tools into the Neve to sum out of the Neve. I then have those patched straight into the Alpha for a little bit of mix bus compression and then we record it back into Pro Tools. And that's basically what we're doing. Now I'm going to demonstrate an A-B scenario where we have the drums which are flat, unprocessed, and then the drums processed. Now because there's a rather a lot of uh, bypass buttons here, I'd need all my fingers to do this and it would be a mess. I've actually pre-recorded um, the processed drums and then when I switch to input on the uh, drum kit um, in Pro Tools, then that's unprocessed. So you get the natural uh, sound of the drums. Here we go. So now you get a chance to listen to the whole drum solo.